Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending July 19th. First up, I want to feature a series that is going on right now from a user on YouTube and a friend of mine called Trans de Tendal. He is from Denmark. He's doing a tour of the Danish Museum of Science and Technology. I think right now he's up to part 23. These are all narrated in English. He does a very good job. I think the average length of the videos varies from about 15 minutes to some of them are under a minute. He's just showing various sections of the museum, but a really good series, 23 parts. I'm up to part 14 right now, so if you're into science and technology, the, the Danish Science and Technology Museum is just totally fascinating, and it looks a little bit different than your typical uh, U.S. or uh, even other European museums that I've seen, so I think it's well worth checking out. I will have a link down below to the part one of his series, and then you can just follow from there on and also have a link to his channel. So if you get a chance to check this out, it's a very good series if you're into science and technology. First story up is from cedarssinai.edu. Transplanting gene into injured hearts creates biological pacemakers. This is uh, something that I also had a chance to listen to on uh, public radio. They had it on Science Friday. And uh, what they're doing is they did some experiments with pigs, and they took samples of heart tissue, and they turned this heart tissue into uh, specialized pacemaker cells. Your heart does have a built-in pacemaker. It's specialized cells of your heart, but in the case of some people, your pacemaker cells go wrong, or they're not, for some reason, they die or whatever. And I guess something like 300,000 people every year have to have pacemakers put in them, and it's a uh, pretty radical surgery and there's a lot of complications. There's some people that just can't have it done because they have uh, some effects from surgery they can't tolerate this way would be way less invasive. They don't even have to open up your chest to do this. I guess they make a small hole down in your leg and they go up through one of your uh, uh, blood vessels in your leg and just snake the thing up there and then um, inject, basically do it like kind of like an injection of injecting these cells on the surface of your heart and then the pacemaker starts working. They've tested it out and uh, so far, they say the the difference between pigs and human hearts is so small that uh, they're pretty certain this would work on humans and uh, might be something they could actually start using in a few years. Would uh, certainly uh, be a great thing for everybody that needs pacemakers. I mean, having an electrical device inside you, especially one that needs a battery or something like that, rather than replacing it with your own uh, heart cells that are just modified to start as acting as pacemaker cells. So a uh, really nice breakthrough in medical science. Uh, the next three stories, I want to kind of keep with the theme on these next three stories. I love it when technology for one use is totally, or somebody finds out a way to use this in a way that's not even thought about. I mean, something that's just <laughs> radically different than what the original technology was intended for. And my first story is about cell phone towers. Cell phone towers monitor African rains. This is from sciencenews.org. They've been doing this actually in uh, developed countries like the U.S. since 2006. Cell phone signals degrade in certain ways and receive interference and compensate for interference in certain ways depending on how they're being interfered with. And rain is a very particular type of interference because of the multiple frequencies that the cell towers operate on. They're able to detect when rain is happening and compensate for it. So. Uh, in very few cases do you see any disruption to your cell phone service, but actually the cell phone towers and the transmitters are being disrupted quite a lot. They just have a really good ability to compensate by switching frequencies and uh, compensating in other ways. But because they're able to do this so well, they can use these to actually detect uh, not just that it is raining, but detect the amount of rain. So these could actually be used in countries like Africa. You, you figure in these third world countries, people don't have the money and the resources to keep up weather stations and to monitor rainfall and things like that. But uh, pretty much all the developing nations still have lots of cell towers. For some reason, uh, even though people are not very well to do, they do manage to put together enough money to uh, have a cell phone to communicate. So cell phones even in developed countries are very prevalent. And they said that these towers can actually be so accurate at times they can be better than the weather satellites themselves at um, tracking rainfall and stuff. So um, the accuracy levels of these is plenty good enough. And for developing countries like Africa and stuff like that where you're uh, concerned about climate change and different rainfall in different areas, you can uh, get a lot more accurate information. So I think that's a really great idea using that. And the second technology, and this is really odd when I had to read this several times to even figure out what they're even doing, but 
this is an anti-tank missile detector that joins the fight against malaria. Evidently, these detectors for javelin missiles, and the military uses these, I guess, to you know, detect if an enemy has fired a missile at them. These detectors are so sensitive, they can actually modify these for a medical use and detect malaria parasites before the symptoms of malaria even start in a person. And why this is so uh, interesting to do is typically to detect malaria, it has to reach a certain stage. You have to have a, about a four-hour waiting period, and you have to have a person that's specially trained uh, using a microscope to be able to identify this, well, that really slows down treatment. And in some cases, it means in some areas you just don't get treatment because of the expense of it. And it's really important in treating malaria if you can catch it when it's just started. You can actually kill it using a small do smaller dose of drugs with less side effects. Um, typically what they do in most countries is they just wait until the disease symptoms are prevalent and then they start um, treating somebody. And the uh, bad thing about that is some people that contract malaria don't have symptoms for a long time and they can go around spreading it without any symptoms um, happening at all but um, this using this uh, sensor that the military uses they can have an untrained operator within four minutes detect even in one red blood cell even detect the effects of a malaria infection so they can get treatment uh, started right away and uh, a lot less treatment a lot less drugs used to do the same exact thing and the last one up, new, ex inexpensive, and easy to implement computer software provides real-time and highly accurate data on traffic. Um, I'll just read the first uh, couple of paragraphs here. Researchers at the University of Grenada have designed new software that provides real-time data on traffic. It is a device that provides information and traffic flow between cities. Drivers can use this information to choose the fastest route as they plan to drive to their destinations. It is a highly reliable, low-cost method, easy and quick to install, which uses Bluetooth devices. Um, what they basically do is, uh, we already have ways on major highways to uh, do it in a very expensive way using sensors and things like that. Um, you can also use systems if somebody has a very expensive GPS type of thing too, they can actually, uh, I don't know how you do it by choosing a menu or pushing a button or whatever, but you can give traffic reports to your uh, GPS provider and then they can update the traffic information based on how many people report it but this is a very inexpensive way of doing it basically all you would need is some really inexpensive antennas spaced every so often along a, a highway system like say every mile or something like that um, with the receiver and hooked up to a computer and what they do is they use signals from each individual car as cars travel um, along a highway and especially uh, not a major highway but maybe you'd still want to know that there's a traffic jam going on or not your car is actually producing radio waves uh, I think what this is designed for now is to pick up the radio waves that your GPS produces. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, your GPS is uh, just a receiver. Well, even just receivers, they do have signals that do leak out, and those are detectable. Um, also, the fact that you carry a cell phone with you. Your cell phone is transmitting back to the tower every so often. So as long as you can get enough of a signal on a few vehicles to track a group of cars, say you could have car A, B, and C based on the signals you, if you have an antenna and you notice between where the antenna is stationed and a mile down the road, you notice those three, three cars five minutes later or only one mile down the road, you can pretty much surmise by using the computer software that traffic is not moving very fast and there's something going on here. Now, they probably have even a larger sampling of cars than that, but that's just an example that because of the fact they can use these antennas to pick up radio signals that will identify your particular car, and then they can tell how fast your car is moving down the roadway, and even on um, secondary highways and stuff like that, they can give you accurate traffic information for very little cost. And before you think, well, what if they use this to snoop on me or something like that? Believe me, if they really wanted to do that, it takes nothing more than just a little inexpensive camera on a road sign. They can take a picture of your license plate and see, tell exactly who's the owner of the car and probably take a good enough picture to see who's even driving. So um, they, the people say that this is not used in any identifiable way whatsoever. It would be impractical. All they want to do is just identify, hey, particular car A, B, or C is here, and then later on particular car A, B, or C is in another location to see if traffic is moving or not. So... Uh, uh, I think if they really wanted to spy on you that bad, they'd do it probably in a lot better ways than this. So it's probably not being used for that purpose whatsoever. But a very good idea and, uh, yeah, something pretty good to, um, so that you can reroute or something like that in a traffic jam. 
So anyway, that's about it for this week. As usual, I also would like to put a plug in for the Dumpster Divers page on Facebook. If you haven't been there and you do use Facebook, uh, please join the Dumpster Divers. We have uh, close to 200 members right now. So uh, that's it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.